Hey, welcome to the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory class. My name is Julian. If you're joining me for the very first time today, this is a weekly Monday morning lecture series that I host in which I try to provide you with an introductionary lecture to, I don't know, introduce you to the philosophy and theory of Slavoj Žižek, Jacques Lacan, Sigmund Freud, Hegel, Kant, Marx, and we're currently doing a series called On Love. In fact, On Love and How to Find It. The idea is that we're going to investigate the philosophy of love and also take love very seriously because if you think about it, what else is philosophy other than the wisdom of love? Now, I know that a lot of people probably tell you that philosophy is love of wisdom, and yet for me it's the other way around. It is the wisdom of love itself. In fact, Hegel is perhaps, as Zizek has already argued, one of the predominant thinkers of love because he takes love as a metaphor for the unfolding of spirit itself. Anyway, that aside, I just want to say thank you guys so much for joining me today. It makes me so incredibly happy that we have students joining from around the world. I've been reading the comment section and we literally have like almost every country in the world covered, which is wild. Like it makes me so incredibly happy, genuinely, genuinely happy. Like, you know, those advertisements where they talk about something that money can't buy, money can't buy that. Money can't buy the fact that I can feel connected to you guys around the world. So yes, I see the first comments. Please do keep posting where you're joining me from. It makes me so incredibly happy. Like, honestly, Spain, Algeria, Canada, Singapore, Argentina, India. It is mind-blowing. Switzerland, Hong Kong. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. It is really, really special for me to be able to just, I don't know, tap into this kind of collective consciousness. That is... That is for me truly the biggest gift. So thank you guys for posting where you're joining us from. I see South Africa, R Romania, Slovakia, Chile, Hungary. It's insane. Like we are like a United Nations of, of learners here. Chicago, Colombia. Um, also, if you're watching on YouTube, welcome. I've been posting daily YouTube videos. Um, if you go to my channel on YouTube, you can find those as well. And I really appreciate the feedback that you guys have been giving me on that. Basically, if you're joining for the very first time, this is how I like to start my Monday, with a lecture. Because for a long time, I worked as an academic. For example, I worked at the University of Oxford Brookes. I worked at the University of Kent, both of which are in the United Kingdom. I worked at City University of London. And so lecturing and delivering 60-minute lectures was part of what I did every week, and it's something I really enjoyed doing. However, I hope that this is also valuable to you. My goal is that you can start off your week right with a little bit of, I don't know, just like, comfort education, you know, that you can actually feel like you're allowing yourself to chew on something that is intellectually nutritious. And so we're going to be continuing the lecture series that I've been hosting every Monday. It's called, the, um, it's on the philosophy of love. It's called On Love and How to Find It. And if you want to download, it's a little plug, if you want to download all of these, all of these sessions, all of these lectures as a podcast, those are available on Patreon. That's www. I don't know if anyone can type this, but www.patreon.com dash Jenlene and Julian. I'll post a link in the description. Um, and basically these lectures are open access. They're free because I think education should be free. I think that enlightening ourselves and each other is something that we should do as an act of love, not an act of profit seeking. And yet if you'd like to keep these classes available for free for everybody, please do consider becoming a patron. It starts at $5 a month and it gets you downloads for all the classes. And it means that I can keep doing this, um, which I can still do. It's been a dream. I've been doing this for almost two years now, which is insane. It's just absolutely, absolutely mind blowing. And you guys can feed my, my pencil habit. I go through a lot of pencils. That is, that is perhaps my primary expense. Um, my pencil, this is my pencil sharpener. I don't know if this is interesting. And look, look how beat up this pencil sharpener is. This pencil sharpener has been around. Okay, so make yourself comfortable, everybody who's joining us. And this is gonna be a, I don't know, 50, 60 minute lecture. And we're gonna talk about love and we're gonna talk about Zizek's theory of love. We're gonna talk about aesthetics. We're gonna talk about beauty. We're gonna talk about dating. We're gonna talk about so many different things from a philosophical standpoint. And my goal is that this will be enriching and will hopefully help you reflect and self-reflect because after all, that is, I think, a really good way to start the week. Okay, so let me begin. Um, and like I, 
like I said before, please, once you've watched this class, do take a look at the Patreon. That's www.patreon.com dash Jeneline and Julian. Jeneline is my beautiful, wonderful, hilarious, smart, funny, perfect, perfectly imperfect wife, Jeneline Pyle. You can find her on my Patreon as well. She is currently editing one of the transcripts. Okay, let us begin. Today we're going to be covering Zizek's theory of dating, which leads him to a critique of the idea of authenticity. We're going to be talking about beauty. Um, we're going to be talking about the idea of a kind of collective belief that you have within yourself in a relationship. And we're just going to sort of see where that takes us. Um, this is something that I do without notes. So we're just going to, I'm not improvising. I do have a pretty clear sense of what I want to do. Um, but that's the basic gist of it. Okay, I want to start with an idea which you might call, I don't know, the perfection of imperfection. And this is something that comes from one of my favorite writers, and it is Antoine, apologies to the French watching, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who is the writer you may well know from The Little Prince. And he has a definition of perfection that I find really profound and like philosophically important. Antoine de saint exupéry says that perfection isn't when there's nothing that could be added. Instead, perfection is when there's nothing that could be taken away. And if you think about that, it's like, okay, what does he mean? Basically he means that you can't try to chase perfect like a point at which everything is perfect, a point in which you are perfect, right? It's not saying that there's nothing that could be added. It's not completion. Instead, perfection is when there's nothing that could be taken away. Because think about it. Often when we're chasing perfection, you think you need to eliminate something. For example, when I used to be younger and I really struggled with my skin, I had really bad acne when I was a teenager, like really bad acne, like the kind of acne where... I'd look in the mirror and I just, I didn't want to touch my face. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want to make eye contact with anybody. I felt terrible in my own body because I was disgusted with myself. And so I thought that other people would be disgusted with me. And the funny thing is, you know, I've worked in education at universities and a lot of my students, my first year students, they have terrible acne and yet I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I like, I wish I could go to them and hug them and just tell them you are perfectly imperfect. You think that you are looking terrible. And yet to me, it doesn't matter, right? We're all trapped within our own consciousness and our own insecurities. And so when I was a teenager, I would look at myself and I would think this is monstrous. And I know that other people can see it. And I wish that I were more perfect. I wish that I could eliminate the bad skin, which for a while I simply couldn't. It was a, just what it meant to have hormones that were exploding. And this is the problem when you think that perfection is an absence of your imperfections, because then you could, it never ends. You say something like, well, if only I were taller, or if only I had a smaller nose, or if only I had bigger muscles. If you conceive of perfection or perfect as here are all the things that I have to eliminate within myself in order to achieve perfection, then you're tearing yourself apart, plus you're never gonna get there. This is like what happens sometimes when people get addicted to plastic surgery, and I don't think, I'm not saying plastic surgery is bad necessarily, right? But once you make one change, where do you know how to stop? You keep thinking, well, if I make another one, it's like, everybody's had this before, it's like, when it's the famous image of cutting a hedge and you don't know when to stop, or you're a painter and you keep going back to your painting and you're like, if I make one more brush stroke, then it will be perfect. And you know, there's a beautiful scene in the movie, Mr. Turner, which is a biopic about William Turner. And William Turner has one of his beautiful romantic paintings of like a storm, like the Burkean sublime that is on exhibit at the um, Academy of Fine Arts in London, at the Royal Academy. And Turner is in the building and he's looking at all these paintings and he sees his own painting and he looks at it and he gets really, really close to the screen. 
Yes, this is recorded, by the way, for the people in the comments. If you're a patron, you can download these on Patreon. I also save them. And so William Turner looks really closely at his painting, and then he gets a little brush with some red paint on it, and he goes, swat, and he puts a dab of red paint on it. And everybody's shocked, like all the other artists and critics who are in attendance go, oh, he's just ruined his painting. And yet Turner knows the truth. Turner knows that his painting was too perfect, that it was so perfect that it was plain. And by adding this one little brush stroke, this dash of red, suddenly it comes alive. And that's one of the geniuses about William Turner's art is that he finds these little strokes, these little imperfections that somehow trick our brain or somehow hack our consciousness to buy it, to believe it, to feel emotionally involved in his paintings. And that's of course because it becomes a metaphor for the human condition, which is that what makes us perfect isn't the absence of imperfection. What makes us perfect is precisely imperfection. That perfect lies within imperfection itself. And so back to the saint Exupéry quote, right? The writer of The Little Prince. He says that perfection, the definition of perfection, isn't when there's nothing that could be added the definition of perfection when there's nothing that could be taken away. And so we've already defined the first part, right? Perfection isn't saying, oh, if only I didn't have a big nose, or if only I had blue eyes, if only I could change something about myself. Instead, what he's saying is that perfection lies within imperfection. Namely, I am a composite of features and memories and experiences none of which can be taken away from me without fundamentally changing who I am. This is one of the things that you realize as you grow older is that life isn't just a series of happy memories. In fact, your brain is rigged in such a way that you're always going to emphasize or overemphasize the negative. That the things that you learn the most from aren't the things that worked out, they're the things that didn't work out. That sometimes, for example, when it comes to a relationship, the precondition for being a happy, healthy lover is to have been hurt, is to have gone through heartbreak. That you realize that a breakup, as bad as it is, can sometimes actually set the scene for a more fulfilling, enriching life and relationship. That nothing is ever wasted. This is something that I believe in very strongly, is that, of course, we would want everything to work out all the time. Who wouldn't? And yet, fundamentally, the very idea of everything being perfect relies on the fact that things have been imperfect, that you know it could be better, that you know that you've been hurting, you know that you can get somewhere that you weren't before. And so basically there's this idea that you might characterize as the perfection of imperfection. Now, Slavoj Žižek, Slovenian philosopher, provocateur, um, thinker, you may have seen on this account, certainly if you're watching on YouTube. Zizek has a really interesting theory about the perfection of imperfection. And he talks about a woman he met in Latin America. And he says that this woman was in her late 30s. She was fairly conventionally attractive. And that she told him a story that she had been with a lover and that the man had told her, if only you lost 30 pounds, then you would be perfect. <laughs> Which is not a very nice thing to say to somebody, by the way, like no surprise that that relationship didn't work out. And Zizek tells her, he says, the one thing that you should not do is lose 30 pounds. Because if you lost 30 pounds, you wouldn't be perfect. You would be plain. And once again, this is the idea of the perfection of imperfection. It's not saying you shouldn't improve yourself. It's not saying you shouldn't try to live a healthy life. 
It's saying that this idea of perfection lies within your imperfection. That if you chase perfect, you'll end up finding plain. Sometimes people tell you that if you chase perfect, you'll find excellence, but the opposite is true. If you conform to exactly how other people think you might look, you just end up looking like everybody else. And Jizek relates this. He says that this is the central lesson of Lacanian desire. That it is never about the object of desire, but it is about the object cause of desire. Now, these are both conceptual terms, so they might require some explaining. For the French psychoanalyst Lacan, there's a difference between object and object cause. The object of desire is the thing that you think you want. In this case, losing 30 pounds or perfection. The object cause is the reason you want it, or if you will, the secret underlying it. And for Lacan, the secret is always the same. Namely, for Lacan, the secret underlying all desire is that you don't want the object of your desire. You want to keep on desiring. And so think about it. If you were to lose 30 pounds and you've achieved the object of your desire, would you feel perfect? No, you would still be chasing perfection, except now it wouldn't be 30 pounds. Now it would be 50 pounds, or it would be surgery, or it'd be having more money, or whatever. The horizon of your desire would remain the same, even though you'd gotten the thing that you thought you wanted. And so what's important here is to say that if the object of desire is the loss of weight, which you equate erroneously with perfection, then once you've achieved that goal, you still haven't achieved perfect. Perfect simply shifts to another goal. And so the object cause of desire isn't 30 pounds. The object cause of desire is that you can't reach perfect. You can't plant your flag on the Isle of Perfect. It's not possible. The idea and the illusion of perfection persists within imperfection itself. And once you realize that, it's kind of liberating, right? Because it's like, well, if I can't reach perfect, then in a sense, I already have perfect. It's not saying just sit on a couch and eat potato chips and allow yourself to turn into a slob because Julian told you you're perfect. It's not coddling. Instead, it's saying that perfection is a kind of excess. It's a kind of mirage that exists within imperfection. And so for Zizek, of course, this relationship between the object of desire, namely 30 pounds less equals perfect, and the object cause of desire, namely imperfection equals perfect, i.e. I, I will always chase perfect, that I can't reach it. What I desire is not to be perfect, right? What I desire is to remain desirous of perfection makes you realize that perfection lies within imperfection itself. Now, let's put that idea aside for a moment and we'll return to it in a little bit. Another way that we chase perfect is when it comes to the idea of authenticity, right? Because we think about it, think about it. Your true self, the real you, is another way of saying that you've achieved perfect, right? You are acting authentically. This is something that the French existentialists were a little bit obsessed about. The French existentialists had this idea of mauvaise foi, which I talked about last week as well, or false consciousness. The idea being, in a nutshell, that we often act inauthentically, that the manner in which we act isn't in alignment with our intentions or our values, or that the manner in which we speak doesn't sync up with the manner in which we think. However, you think about that false consciousness and you think, well, 
What if there's a fundamental error of attribution going on here? Namely, that you ever truly could be authentic. Namely, that your actions will ever truly sync up with your intentions. What if it's the other way around? What if your intentions, instead of being a priori to your actions, emerge retroactively in response to said actions? You do something and then you're afterwards thinking, well, maybe I should have said X. Maybe I should have responded differently. It's like the very idea that we had an a priori autonomous pre-existing motivation is often something that we project onto an action after the fact because we doubt whether we interacted in an authentic manner or a manner that was true to ourselves. And so the whole idea of mauvaise foi or the idea of acting in bad faith, as they call it, relates to this idea that the manner in which you interact in society also influences the manner in which you act towards yourself. Now, a lot of self-help gurus at this point will tell you something like you have to extract yourself from your environment. That, you know, you are a seed in a pot and that the pot is your environment and that the pot is impacting the level of your growth. That if you could extricate yourself from negative influences and family and friends and everything that's holding you down, that you too will blossom. And I don't necessarily doubt that. Obviously, circumstances change us. And yet, what remains misleading about that idea is the notion not only that by yourself you will thrive, which I believe to be fundamentally untrue. I think that we unlock our true potential not by isolating ourselves, but precisely by seeking communion with others. But secondarily, also the idea that there is such a thing as an authentic self or a true you. This is one of the central claims of Lacanian psychoanalysis, that there is no real you. That, yes, you wear a mask every day. In fact, you may wear multiple masks for different people. You wear a mask at work. You wear a mask with your relatives, you wear a mask with your friends, you're constantly masking, both literally and figuratively. And yet, the Lacanian insight is not that there is a real you underneath your mask, but that you are your own mask. That underneath the multiple layers of appearances that you project outwards, lies simply another layer of appearance, namely the idea of authenticity that you project towards yourself, which usually is an idea of authenticity that you feel like you are failing to live up to. Think about it, very few people say, oh, I am, I am authentic, I am my true self. I've lived up to my potential. It's usually exactly the other way around. Authenticity haunts us, it chases us. We think the manner in which we expressed ourselves, was that authentic? How will people interpret it? Am I really saying the thing that I believe? Authenticity haunts us like a kind of specter of ourselves. It's like, there's this great idea about friendship. The idea that a friend is like a shadow. Sorry, a fake friend is like a shadow, sorry. Totally flubbing. A fake friend is like a shadow. Namely, they're there during the light and they disappear at dark, which I like. Now think about that from the perspective of authenticity. It's exactly the other way around. We feel perfectly authentic in the light, and during the dark hours, we question our motives. We feel inauthentic. We feel like somehow stuck within our own consciousness. We can't hit the pause button. I truly, genuinely believe that one of the things that we all have in common is that we wish that we could hit the pause button on being alive. That as soon as you are thrown into existence, it's like we talk about stream of consciousness, what we don't talk about is the fact that there is no alternative to streaming of consciousness. You can streamline your consciousness, but you can't step outside of it, right? And this is something I talked about last week. This is what Freud and Lacan call the death drive. The death drive isn't the movement towards life. It's not you've been plunked here on earth and now you basically are just biding your time until you inevitably expire. Instead, it's the what Fichte, the philosopher Fichte, who's also a key inspiration on Hegel, 
called the fundamental paradox of existence. It's a big word, but what he means is that all existence is negation. In other words, everything that you do is something that expires something else. For example, yes, you might say this, hello, YouTube. And what that means is, for example, if you eat something, right, you've taken this, I don't know, this material thing and you've put it into your mouth and you've digested it and you've taken out the nutrients and the fact that it tastes good is an incentive for you to do this. And so you've negated what is in the fruit, right? You have simply allowed yourself to live another day by means of negation or consuming something else. If you think about it, this is even like the whole idea of life on earth is light coming from the sun and photosynthesis creating energy within plants that creates energy within human beings. It's a continued lineage of negation. It's almost a little bit deliberate act it's an intentional act. I am giving you marketing and giving you what I know about philosophy. There's an exchange that we have because we know that everything we do is negation. It's a negation of time. It's a negation of change. I'm going to very quickly try to um, reduce for all the technical difficulties. I think we might have slightly better internet now. Change isn't negation. Change is simply the universal condition of life as such. There is no absence of change. There can be a temporary cessation of change, and yet change is happening all the time. In fact, one thing that doesn't change is precisely change. It is immutable in that sense. It is the precondition for the passage of life. Negation, however, is the manner in which we assert our own self, our existence, apropos change. Think about it. If change is like a river, you're not just floating downstream. You're not just a log. Instead, you're fighting upstream. And so negation relates to change in the same manner that a swimmer relates to the tide that, is trying, that he is trying to fight. Negation for Nietzsche is there by the assertion of will. The assertion of will is the process by which you negate change. Now, what I want to say about this is why are we talking so much about negation? Well, if you think about it, if existence is simply thereby the process of negation, then the idea of authenticity is the same illusion as the idea of perfection. If you think that perfection lies beyond the horizon of imperfection, then you might be inclined to think that authenticity lies beyond the horizon of inauthenticity. That if you acted authentically, you would have reached the perfect mode of your own being. And this is why Slava Zizek argues that the idea of authenticity is the ultimate fake. In fact, that it's good to live in a society in which people learn how to present themselves inauthentically. Now let's say a step back, right? Because you think, well, maybe this is too normative. Maybe authentic and inauthentic isn't a binary, maybe it's a spectrum, and I would agree with you. And so, let's go back to Lacanian psychoanalysis. Remember, we talked about the object cause of desire versus the object of desire. The object of desire might be, I want to lose 30 pounds. The object cause of desire is, I want to keep on thinking that there is something I could do to be better. Optimization, right? And so what happens for Zizek is he says that if you are your own mask, if all the appearances that you present to others exist to further fuel the illusion that there is a true authentic core underneath, then this is the ultimate appearance. We can relate this to Plato's allegory of the cave. In the classic metaphysical minor that Plato projects, we have the world of the cave, which is the world of illusion. And outside the cave, we have the world of light and truth. It's a metaphysical binary because he's positing that there is a higher or ideal state outside the cave. And that in order to reach that, you have to pull yourself away from the illusions in the cave. Now, what are the illusions? Plato says that there's a big fire behind you. 
and the big fire is creating shadows on the wall, shadows that are reflections of the world outside, and misconstrue what is being projected on the wall, and we think that it is more true than what lie outside. And so we become slaves to the world of appearances, to illusion, to projections. That's the classic binary, the metaphysical binary that Plato introduces. In fact, if you understand that, you understand one of the key components of the entire development of the history of philosophy. It's really, in many ways, it's that simple. That's important for me that we can simplify. Now, it's important to note that someone like Zizek, someone like Hegel, 200 years earlier, one of the key influences on Zizek, doesn't believe in the binary platonic metaphysics. Doesn't believe that you could exit the cave and enter into the world of truth. In fact, what if the ultimate illusion is precisely that you are the one who has exited the cave and that you are back in the cave trying to convince everybody else to leave, right? This is what Plato says, that the task of the philosophers to exit the cave and to return to the cave and then open everybody else's eyes. But Zizek's argument is that this is the fundamental illusion or what Lacan would call the fundamental fantasy. Namely, what if everybody is in the cave and everybody's convinced that they're the ones who have woken up? That they're the ones who have seen the truth. What if the very manner in which you are held spellbound is by having convinced yourself or having become convinced by others that you are the one who has seen the truth? This is the danger, right? The danger of the argument that you have woken up, that you have seen the truth, that everybody else is a sheep. As soon as you start suspecting that everybody else is dumb and that you are the smart one, it's probably a sign that it is exactly the other way around. And so one of the things that Zizek does is he simply relates this critique of Plato's allegory of the cave, which is a Hegelian critique, to his theory of ideology. And we covered this a little bit last week, but I can do a recap. So ideology for Zizek isn't a political ideology. It's not, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. Instead for Zizek, ideology is what frames the manner in which we interact with the world. Think about it. Like you're playing in a game, basketball, football, and there are rules and there are referees and there are uniforms and there are spectators. And yet some people probably me when I was a kid, would look at it and say, why are you just trying to put a ball into a net? What is the point? Look, I love sports, right? But if you think about it, this whole energy that goes into it, marketing and the mythology of athletes and buying sneakers and watching it on TV and slow motions and everything about sports is hugely meaningful. And yet, in a sense, it means nothing. There's a, it's like, what does it really mean? What's the point? It's like more goals. It just repeats. And yet, this is the sublime element within sports, right? The sublime for Kant is always something that is defined by the fact that it cannot be defined, that its essence is the very fact that it is inessential. Think about what a love poem is. When you say to somebody, I love you so much, I can't put it into words, that's the sublime. Because you have just put it into words. Literally, when you say, I love you so much, I can't put it into words, that is you putting it into words. That's the sublime. And if you think about it, this is why sport is beautifully sublime. The whole idea is that it means nothing, and yet it means nothing. It becomes like bigger, larger than life. The triumphs, the trials and tribulations that we see athletes go through mirror what we feel like we go through in our own life. There's a sublime element to sport because it seems to encapsulate life itself when 
it is in a sense has nothing to do with life. Like the fact that from a distance you could throw a ball into a net is not a life skill. Of course, you can become very lucrative if you can do it well. But that's precisely because of other people's libidinal investment. On a side note, if you're asking about, could you please see, save these live sessions? Yes, they're all saved on my Instagram and YouTube. But if you'd like to download them as a podcast, you can also find them on Patreon. I very much appreciate it if you guys would take a look at my Patreon. It's www.patreon.com dash Jenna Lean and Joy. Um, that's how I keep doing this. Okay, so there's this sublime element. And for Zizek, the sublime element exists within subjectivity itself. It's an idea that he takes from Lacan. In the same manner that imperfection is the precondition for perfect, in other words, that perfection lies within imperfection, this is the sublime aspect of perfection. You can't chase it. The only way in which you chase it or achieve it is by missing it, right? This is the idea. Perfection lies within imperfection. The truth of my love lies within the fact that I have told you that I cannot tell you how much I love you. Art that depicts the sublime never depicts the sublime. It depicts our failure to access it. Whether it's a storm in William Turner's paintings, whether it's the idea of Christ on the cross, the very fact that we depict the non-transcendental becomes the very precondition for the manifestation of the transcendental. And so if you take that idea of the sublime and you relate it back to Plato's allegory of the cave, it's not so much that there's a world of truth beyond the cave and there's a world of, of illusion in the cave. It's kind of the other way around. It's the idea that truth is only made manifest within the cave itself. And what is that truth? The truth, the secret core underlying it, is precisely thereby that the ultimate illusion is the idea that you have already exited the cave or that you could exit the cave. In other words, the secret or the truth underlying the binary of essence and appearance is precisely that essence is only made manifest within appearance itself. And what is the essence made manifest within appearance is precisely the fact that there is no essence that is not mediated outside the world of appearances and illusions. Now that's very abstract, but we can break it down. Essentially, what Jizek is saying, in a much more universal sense, is that the very idea of authenticity is inauthentic. And vice versa, that you can achieve authenticity by embracing your inauthenticity. This is what Lacan calls the fundamental fantasy. What is the fundamental fantasy? Well, it's simply the idea that there is a real authentic you underneath the masks that you wear. That beyond the masks, and appearances that you project out towards the world, and beyond the world of appearances that there's authentic, true selfhood. Think about it. This whole idea that at some point you could like transcend the world of fantasy around you, and you could find a moment of inner spiritual truth, that is precisely what is used to lure you back in into the world of the commodity, as Marxists would call it. When somebody tries to sell you something, one of the easiest lessons of marketing is an idea that Schopenhauer already had. Schopenhauer, that if you want to sell something to somebody, you don't sell them the product, you sell them themselves. What's more tempting? Here's a house that you could buy versus here's the person you could be in that house. Here's the wealth that you could generate for future generations. That's the product. The product is you. Like, marketers understand this perfectly well. But they don't have to sell you something because one thing marketers already know is that you already want it. In fact, you already want the product. They simply have to create the reasons for you to want it. Like, the reasons for you to make the purchase. And how do you make somebody make purchase or commit to something well, it's to say this isn't an investment in an object. This is an investment in you. It's classic marketing strategy. So we're actually back at where we started in this lecture, which is that it's about the relationship between the object of desire and the object cause of desire. The object of desire is the product being sold to you, but the object cause of desire is that you are your own product. That the best way to sell you an item is to sell you the idea that you are simply investing in yourself, that you are one step closer to reaching your idea true self. And that's when you realize again that 
when you buy something, it's never going to fulfill you. It's never going to make you happy. This is the whole point is that when you buy something, you immediately want to buy something else. Because what you're chasing isn't the object. What you're chasing is the object cause of the object. Which is another way of saying that you don't want to be satisfied. You don't want to be done. Think about it. As soon as you're done, it feels like life is done. If life is simply the continuing process of negation, then consumerism convinces us that as long as we consume well, then we are not negating. This is the weird paradox that happens within a consumer society is that we all believe ourselves to be immortal as long as we are in the process of actively negating through consumer choices. Literally, retail therapy is a thing. It's like a word, a concept. The idea that you could buy stuff so that you can feel better about yourself, so that you can blur out momentarily through giving yourself retail highs, the fact that none of it matters, none of it's gonna last. And even that insight is then repackaged to you as a further commodity. There's an advertisement I keep getting on YouTube. Is Ewan, Ma Ewan McGregor, the actor, looks into the camera and he says, when you die, what will you regret more? The things that you didn't buy or the things or the places you didn't go? And I think to myself, this is, this is sophistry. Because the places you didn't go, he's trying to sell you something. He's trying to sell you a plane ticket, a vacation. The argument is, when you die, what are you going to regret more? The things you didn't buy or the things you didn't buy, essentially. He's just saying, don't stop buying. He's saying, buy better. And how do you buy better? It's by investing in you, supposedly. And so every marketer understands this, that they're not selling you a product. They're selling you you. And the best way to incentivize that, of course, is to raise the specter of your own mortality. At the end of the day, I, I tell you this, I promise you, when you die, you're not going to regret or think about, did I buy the right things? That's marketing talk. When you die, will you, should I have bought a PlayStation or should I have bought a holiday? Nobody regrets did I buy the PlayStation or the holiday? At the end of the day, when you reach your end, the thing that you're gonna regret is how did I spend my time? Not how did I spend my money? And what marketers do is they convince you that the only manner in which you can spend your time is to correctly spend your money. And that's of course, in a sense, a very simplified version of the Marxist idea about the commodity fetish. The commodity fetish is not only the process by which we imbue commodities with a kind of life force, an animating reason to exist, but we start thinking of ourselves as a commodity, that our lifespan appears to us, remember, this is a simplified take, that our lifespan appears to us as a kind of accumulation of value that we can spend, that the hours that you are alive are like tokens, and if you spend them well, then you have lived a good life, and if you don't spend them well, you have lived a poor life, but that's not how life works. Life isn't saying, here's, a blank check and you get to basically do whatever you want, spend it well. This is the idea of bourgeois morality. Bourgeois morality for Marx, very antiquated term, I know, is simply the process by which you think you are a good person because you have learned to spend your money on good things. And think about it, like you read magazines or websites that say, here are the 10 things you should buy or the 10 clothes that will make you look attractive or the 10, I don't know, vacation destinations so that you will have, whatever, achieved your bucket list, right? I hate the idea of a bucket list. When do we allow ourselves to be convinced that life has boxes which have to be checked usually which require me writing a check. It's an insane idea of what it means to be alive. And so it's because we're chasing perfection that we run right past it. One said, he said that the more you chase happiness, the more you realize that it was right in front of you already. It's this great idea that there's something humbling life. I think it's Chesterton who wrote that your greatest moments, your highs, aren't when you soar. It's when you bow. In other words, when you make yourself subject 
instead of being subject. Marketers will sell you the idea of authenticity, of the real you, of your true potential. They will sell you the product which is you so that you can soar. And yet, instead of buying into the hype, you have to learn that the weird paradox is that you soar when you bow. That you are at your greatest when you are at your most humble. That you are at your truest self when you have learned to, and this is the Lacanian idea, is that you give yourself, you empty yourself on behalf of the other. This isn't saying that you should do everything the other person wants. It's not saying that you should be slavishly following your passions or make yourself subject to another in a relationship that way. What it means is that as long as you're chasing fulfillment, perfection, authenticity, you're not going to find it. You find it within imperfection. Perfection lies within imperfection. Happiness lies within a certain unhappiness. The truth of your authentic self lies within your false appearances. This is what the whole point of Zizek's critique of Plato and ideology is, is that anybody who promises you that you can exit ideology is selling you ideology. The most ideological thing you could say isn't here's how you should vote, here's what you should drink, here's what you should think. The most ideological thing you can do is to promise someone that they're not ideological. Think about it, all the politicians who are saying, I say it as it is, I'm a straight shooter. Those are precisely the politicians that you should be very suspicious of. The ones who are projecting authenticity have learned that the ultimate inauthentic act is assuming the avatar of the authentic. And this is why, like, it doesn't matter to me if somebody is like a regular Joe, somebody I could have beers with. That's the product that's being sold to you as a voter, is vote for the person who appears most like you. And now we're stuck in the same feedback loop where it's like, well, if you're not buying the thing, you're buying the dream of a better you, then you're not buying into your country, you're buying into the dream of a better you again. Namely, a regular joke will make a country better. And this whole idea of authenticity as a kind of ultimate performance act lies at the heart of ideology itself. In the same manner that ideology is at its strongest when you're being told that you have exited outside of ideology, that you are non-ideological, that you have seen the truth, that you have woken up. In the exact same way, the politician who is the least authentic is precisely the one who keeps pretending to be authentic. And so we're back at the idea of the sublime. We're back at this idea that perfection lies beyond imperfection. Perfection lies within imperfection itself. Authenticity doesn't lie beyond inauthenticity. It lies within authenticity. The world of truth isn't outside the cave. It's rather made manifest within the cave. It's a radical upheaval, if you will, of the metaphysics that go all the way back to the allegory of the cave. Now, this is why Zizek says that when it comes to dating, one of the concerns people have about dating is that they say, well, it's inauthentic, right? How can you possibly project the real you in whatever, 50 characters or a photograph? Think about, for example, happening right now on Instagram or even everywhere on the internet. We've learned that taking pictures like this doesn't look great. And so now the new play on the internet is how do you project authenticity in an innately inauthentic manner? And so like, well, are you more relatable by talking about all the things that you don't do well? Are you more relatable by showing all the things that you would otherwise hide? It's like on the internet, we've gone through this weird consciousness shift where for about 10 years, every millennial was trying to project inauthenticity, wealth, happiness. Everything's perfect all the time. My breakfast looks better than yours. And now we've gone to the other side whereby everything has to look bad and kind of shitty and bad photos and weird camera angles. And now my authenticity is because I take pictures like this and there are pictures like this. That process, however, remains the same. It's just that We've seen through the idea of everybody's fakeness on the internet, and so now we've reinvented fakeness by pretending to be authentic. 
Like, this is the evolution of the internet. It's not saying we used to be fake and now we're authentic. No, it's that we used to be upfront about our fakeness. And now we're hiding our fakeness between, behind the idea of authenticity. I, I honestly believe that, like, the new fake is being authentic. Everybody is supposed to be their real self, their true self. And to go back to dating, right? A lot of people critique online dating. They say, well, online dating is fake because you have to put up a picture of yourself. And so you look like, I don't know, you look like a muscle man and it's like you look really attractive. Or if you wear a uniform, you get more likes or something. And yet, Zizek argues that there's nothing wrong with this. What would be more wrong is the idea of authenticity. The idea that you could somehow project the real you onto a dating platform and that somebody would find you and would just instantly click because two souls had met in an authentic way. And think about the dangerous subversive element within the very idea of authenticity. Like, too dark here. you go back to World War II and you go back to the Nazis and the idea of the Third Reich, the whole idea of like the Lebensraum and the German living space, the whole toxic energy that went into anti-Semitism revolved around the idea of authenticity. Let's learn to be real men so that we can be a real people and we can have real values and we can live in our real country and we can be part of real 3,000 years spanning Reich. This idea of authenticity was very strong within fascism. It's one of the weird things is that fascism it's very closely related to the authentic. One of the key elements of fascism is always to say, I am, I am people. It's this weird disconnect, right? Because within a democratic society, when you are voting for somebody, you know that there is a disconnect between your issues and their issues. Just how it is. You can't take millions of people and their collective interests and find the exact representation of that in a political system. And yet it's precisely the totalitarian leaders who say, I am the embodiment of the will of the people. I am the people. And we use papering over this gap. Lacan has a very interesting theory of this. Lacan says that this is what he calls psychotic foreclosure. So basically, psychotic foreclosure is when there's a gap between something particular and something universal. For example, there's a gap between who you are as a person and the idea of the people. Psychotic closure is when you simply say, uh-uh, there is no gap, I am the people. Because this is the way in which you breach the gap between your particular identity and the idea of collective the people, it's by saying, I am the people. Lacan relates this to uh, Christian fundamentalism. He says that there's a gap between you and God has to be. Even if you believe in God, the idea is God is up there in the sky. You are down here on earth. You don't know what to do with yourself because you don't know who God is, whether he exists, etc. Kantian morality is simply the process by which you say, I don't know what God wants from me, but I'm going to act as if I knew. Now, Lacan says that this gap is good. Psychotic foreclosure is when you eliminate the gap by simply creating a tautology. Instead of a versus B, now A and B are the same. Namely, it's not I am a person trying to figure out what God wants from me. Now it's I am the embodiment of God's will. That's a God for closure. It's megalomania, if you will. And so the same thing happens within authoritarian totalitarian politics. Namely, it's not I am the leader is trying to figure out what the people want from me. It's saying, I am the leader because I am the people. It's the same as Christian fundamentalism or any fundamentalism. Not, I want to figure out what God would want from me, but I am God. And this foreclosure between the particular and the universal is thereby the very, this is where I'm going with the metaphysical argument, the very foreclosure that Jesus accuses Plato of. Think about it. If the world of truth is outside the cave, and you are in the cave, and you believe that you see the world of truth, and you've returned to enlighten everybody else, then you're simply saying, I am truth. I am the truth. I inhabit the space of truth. Hence, psychotic foreclosure. You've taken the gap between the world of truth outside the cave and the world of appearances inside the cave, and you've simply said, there is no gap. I am the bringer, the harbinger of truth. 
And this kind of enlightened position of the subject who has seen beyond the world of appearances for Zizek itself the biggest ideology. For Lacan, it's itself the fundamental fantasy. The idea that you could go beyond imperfect to perfect. The idea that you could extrapolate yourself from inauthenticity to reach the authentic. The idea that you could go beyond being the base, mortal, finite subject and achieve the immortal. The idea that you could do that. That is what Lacan calls psychotic foreclosure. And that's how Zizek takes a Lacanian idea, namely psychotic foreclosure, and he links it back to the idea of metaphysics, which is a critique of Plato in the, in the lineage of Hegel. Because this is something you have to understand, right, about all these lectures. This, what Zizek simply does is Zizek takes and uses Lacanian concept and he infuses them with a Hegelian critique, which is usually a critique of Kant. Namely, the relationship between transcendental idealism, which is Kantian idealism, and speculative idealism, which is Hegelian idealism. And he uses that through the lens of super universal things like dating and love and romance and authenticity. Right? This is essentially what Zizek does in a nutshell. It's a very simple and yet rich formula. Now, to finish, we were talking about Saint Exupéry on the Saint Exupéry the little prince, the right prince, and his quote about perfection. And he says that perfection isn't when there is nothing that you could add. Instead, perfection is when there's nothing that you could take away. And this is precisely Zizek's critique of platonic metaphysics. Perfect, the ideal truth, isn't when you've exited the cave. It's when you've realized that you can't exit the cave that there is nothing beyond the world of appearances itself. In Lac Lacanian, you are your own mask. That the fundamental fantasy which has to be traversed for Lacan is the fantasy of authenticity, the fantasy of perfect, the fantasy of happiness, the fantasy of fulfillment, the fantasy of authenticity. I may have repeated myself. And of course, from a metaphysical perspective, the fantasy of stepping outside the cave. And once you realize that, the subject is you, the material marker of the sublime, namely the process by which perfection is made manifest within imperfection, that authenticity is made manifest within inauthenticity, that truth is made manifest within appearances, that you are your own mask. That's when you've traversed the fundamental fantasy. And that's Zizek's idea of love. Okay, we're going to get back there next week. Thank you guys so much for watching. I super appreciated doing this. This is fun. I enjoyed doing this. I know like basically I try to start relatable and then we build it up and we build it up. And then by the end of the class, I try to make it super technical because that's what I think is fun. I hope that this has been valuable to you. If it has been, please do take a moment to think about becoming a patron because these classes, these lectures are totally free. They're open access. Anybody can watch them. I love that people watch from around the world. But if you want to download these live streams as a podcast, that's available for patrons. You can also ask live questions after every class on Patreon. So I'm going to give you the link. And if you're watching this, I genuinely would appreciate it if you guys checked out the Patreon. It starts at just $5 a month. And it makes a huge difference for me. Like, this is a passion project. I love doing it. It's very niche. And it gives me so much joy and energy. And sharing that with you, starting my week with you, is such an incredible gift. So if you've enjoyed this, if you'd like to download the entire session and every lecture I've ever recorded, please go to www.patreon.com dash gentling and Julian. Hello to Paris. I wish I were right now. I might actually, you know how every American says, oh, I'll move to Paris, like it's a cliche. I'm actually thinking of moving to Paris. I might actually move to Paris next winter, not this winter, next winter. Anyway, we'll see. Istanbul, I love Istanbul. Istanbul is where I met my wonderful wife, generally. I used to live in Istanbul. I lived there for uh, several years. Uh, 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 okay, so it's www.patreon.com dash Jeline Jeline. Jeline and I are going to be recording a live podcast Q&A session about this class in five minutes on Discord, which is available exclusively for patrons. However, you can also set up clicking the link in bio. So please head over to www.patreon.com dash Jeline Jeline. I love you guys so much. Thank you for letting me do this. It's the most wonderful way to start my week. And I will see you next week. Bye, guys. Or actually, if you're a patron, I will see you in five minutes. Bye-bye.
Thanks everybody for watching on YouTube. I just also want to add that I'm going to continue to do my daily uh, guide to digitic video series. Um, I'm basically teaching myself how to edit. I don't really know how to do it yet, but my goal is to get a little better every day. I want to say a big thank you for leaving all those comments. I really appreciate your feedback. And it's a cool project. So if you'd like to support it, as per usual, please do check out my Patreon. I'm going to put a link in the description. Until then, I'll see you guys tomorrow.